Dr. Akil Houston, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I'm doing all right, man. I'm doing all right. Uh, we have the, what is it? The Ohio's are in the house, Ohio State and Ohio University. And, uh, okay, so, so the way we met and uh, why I invited you on the uh, on my podcast is uh, we had a pretty interesting conversation in uh, actually in the locker room at the gym, right? And it's uh, it's interesting because with there are fewer. Let's put it this way: there are fewer and fewer places where men, in particular black men, can have frank discussions. Um, and fortunately, uh, the locker room <laughs> has, has not been placed on the banned list yet. So uh, I think we started talking about uh, relationships and, uh, you know, in particular uh, with respect to um, you know, black community, and then we start talking about politics, and we were talking about, you know, a variety of topics, and right. um, and then you started talking, and we talked a little bit about some of your res research, and and I was like, man, I got to get this guy on the show. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate the uh, the invitation, and yeah, it was a good conversation. Uh, not your stereotypical locker room talk. No, no. Uh, well, you know, it's it's interesting because I think that there's a connotation, like as you as you're saying, you know, stereotypical. There's a connotation of locker room talk being maybe crude or crass, or um, you know, maybe like a, 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 a objectifying women or something. You know, there's like that kind of connotation. Um, but in my experience, I, the, the conversation uh, in the locker room, of, oftentimes you end up in, I mean, it, I mean I've, I've ended up in some really uh, good conversations about real stuff, politics, you know, religion, um, the, state of the, the state of the black uh, community, um, you know, like I said, our conversation. And so anyhow, uh, so for it seems like I, I I've seen been seeing you at the gym for some some months or maybe as long as a year maybe just uh, seeing you uh, you know working out lifting weights and all of that and I've been doing the same thing and uh, and then we started bumping into each other and then like I said we culminated in having this conversation and so anyhow you're here and it's Black History Month. It is Black History Month. So, <laughs> how come the month that we got is the shortest month? That's what I want to know. Okay. So, I know the, the popular uh, idea is that, see what they did to us? That's why you got the shortest month. But it's actually because of birthdays, Frederick Douglass and uh, Abraham Lincoln. So originally when uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson is thinking about this is Negro History Week. Uh, and what's different is I think most people think of this month as, you know, let's talk about Garrett A. Morgan and what he did with the uh, traffic light or Madam C.J. Walker and the straightening comb, you know, stuff like that. But really it was supposed to be about intensive study of uh, black contributions uh, to history, to science, and a way to think about our roles in the world to move us forward, not just, you know, you put this on the back of a calendar or you say something cute in a commercial about this is the first person to do X, Y, and Z. Did you know this person was black? Black History Month, sponsored by Insert Major Corporation. So it was really supposed to be about how can we push society forward through a better understanding of these contributions. So uh, a number of people believe that if you can educate the populace, you reduce the likelihood of discrimination based on race, because now you know the worth and the contributions, et cetera. Um, initially it went well and it expanded 
uh, from a week uh, to to a month. Uh, and since that time, uh, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History have tried to maintain his original vision. Uh, the organization's still around. It's a professional uh, Black studies, African American studies organization. But um, it just so happens that those events fall in February. Uh, but it's not necessarily a big conspiracy to uh, defraud black people by giving them uh, the shortest month. Yes. But it, it is yeah. enticing as an argument. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I've heard that uh, as I imagine you have uh, a number of times. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. So, so black history month, uh, Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman doesn't want a Black History Month. I'm sure you've seen the same yeah. videos of that interview that I have. What do you think of his his position on that? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Well, I, I should probably preface my comments by saying um, it, it, things get interesting when... Um, just celebrities in general uh, begin to weigh in on some of these conversations. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not saying that only people uh, who are, you know, scholars or whatever have the authority, but it, it just gets interesting. So I think in principle, what he's saying, if you get beyond the emotion of what did he just say? Um, in principle, I think it makes sense. As I understand it, what he's saying is it should be a part of history. So we shouldn't have a special designation for Black History Month, Women's History Month, Latino awareness, et cetera. Um, these should be things that are just part of history. So I think um, at the basis of it, I, you know, it makes sense. It should be. Uh, in fact, one of the um, great historians, uh, Dr. John Henry Clark, always argued that Black history were the missing pages of world history. Um, so it's mm -hmm. a similar argument. But I think... Um, we have to also deal with, well, what is the reality of why? Um, so it's been this omission um, most times on, on purpose. And so it's like we have to intentionally recognize that these are some contributions that people have made. These are why these issues are important. And I think the more that society moves to a place where certain changes have taken place, it becomes less necessary for a specific focus. So for instance, if a white man becomes the president of Ohio University or Ohio State, we, we don't write in the paper, um, such and so a white man just took yeah. this position, how great and wonderful. No. Um, no. So I think when we can get to the point where if it's a black person, if it's a woman, if it's a you know black woman, um, and that's not the major point of the article or headline, then, you know, we will have seen some progress. But, you know, we, we just had an election and a big piece of that was, oh, look, it's the first uh, multiracial, primarily black woman, uh, vice president. And there's this pomp and circumstance around that. And I understand people are excited, um, but I think once we've moved past that moment, we'll see more tangible um, examples of, of really structural change but i think that we're, we're stuck there um so every time you turn on the tv or you listen it's like oh the first black did such and so or the first woman did such and so uh so it's it's interesting because you think about jackie robinson uh in the 40s and 50s and that's what people were saying oh look it's the first black person in major league baseball so here we are in 2021 still talking about the first black person or woman to do such and so yeah. You know, I interviewed Larry Sharp, um, you know, the libertarian gubernatorial uh, candidate for uh, was it New, uh, York? New York State. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And um, of course, he lost. He has a, a program called the Sharp Way. And, uh, and I which is a show that I watch pretty, pretty, uh, pretty frequently. Uh, <laughs> he's been going in on Cuomo pretty hard. Um, he's a real policy oriented guy. It, I... Thank you so much for watching my video so far. 
If you'd like to support, there are several ways to do so below. Also, likes are free. Please comment, share, and subscribe. Now back to the video. Guy, it, uh, he has a policy perspective. This is him, this is that interview right here. He has a policy perspective on practically any and all issues in a way that I find to be refreshing and much more complete than like almost any Democrat or Republican candidate I've ever seen. And the reason is that as a Democrat or a Republican, all you have to say is, um, that guy's evil. I'm not evil. That guy's evil. Right. Um, and in that interview, he said, you know, <laughs> I only killed one guy. He killed three guys. Yeah, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm just a garden variety killer. That, that's a, that's a, that's a mass murderer over there. That garden, you know, <laughs> so, so there's not a lot of conversation about real policy. Um, and unfortunately black folks have gotten trapped in the middle of this thing where the Democrats, they don't even make any deal. We don't, we don't even get any deals. They don't even make deals. They just expect that we're just going to vote for them. Um, and I think we could increase our power and our persuasion on both Democrats and Republicans if if we would stop voting for Democrats. If we just said, hey, you know what? I'm voting third party. I, I you know, I've had enough of this okie doke. You guys have to earn my vote. I'm not just going there just because. You know? What do you think of that? It's a good question. Uh <laughs> And, you know, I, I don't know if I shared this with you before, but it's I think people want to vote for somebody. Uh, and what I mean by that is when you're looking at the ballot, you're looking at the options like, gosh, um, not this person. So I'm going to go this way. But that's not actually voting for somebody. It's more so I don't want that person in office. Uh, and, I, and I think one of the issues has been uh, the Democratic Party, obviously, from post 1960s forward, right? Um, because we know, and this is the argument a lot of Republicans that I've talked to use that this is the party of Lincoln. This is the party that freed the enslaved. And it's like, well, yeah, you had a different set of priorities back then. Let's talk about why people left um, and join your party during the 50s and 60s. Um, as uh, the former mayor of Atlanta talked about, um, Allen, uh, Mayor Allen, can't think of his first name, but as the state began to turn red, it was uh, largely the, the civil rights issue. Uh, so I think historical context is important before we jump on the bandwagon and say, this is the party that does X and so. But I think one of the reasons is just out of tradition. Uh, I think the Democrats, it, it's like Malcolm X said, the difference between the two parties is the fox and the wolf. Right. One is out to make you a meal and there's no mistake about it. The other is a little more clever. And, and according to Malcolm holds its mouth in such a way you think they're a friend. Um, they're going to take advantage of you. <laughs> so in a lot of ways, I think that analogy is still true. Um, when you yeah. think about how many people uh, mobilized to elect Democratic candidates, um, and if we look at the numbers, uh, particularly, I guess, on everybody's mind is Georgia and how they've been able to flip that uh, longtime red state into blue. Um, and conceivably, it could go blue for a while, but uh, it's almost one of those things where you, you get just a bunch of promises. Uh, we're going to do this. We're going to address this. Um, and again, it's not as forthright as the Republicans. I think one of the things Republicans have done skillfully is to just say, these are our priorities, no matter how bizarre, weird, strange you think they are, we're beholden to preserving power, period. Uh, we're not going to mince words. We're not going to pretend this is what we're about. Um, and the pitch recently has been, uh, why vote for the Democrats? They haven't done any for anything for you. Um, neither have we, but we can make a compelling argument based on their failures. 
So yeah. I think um, if there were, going back to your earlier point, if there were specific policies that people mobilized around and said, okay, you know what? I don't care who is in office. What I care about is these sets of priorities. And I want to know what you're going to do to move this agenda. If you're saying what I like, I'm gonna support you. If not, you don't get my money, you don't get my support. Rather than getting into you know, familiar territory with, you know what, I'll pick the Democrat because they're better than the Republican. Um, but yeah, to your point, um, it's a difficult call because I think the emotional appeal for a number of African-Americans is definitely the Democratic Party. Um, there aren't people uh, running around with neo-Nazis talking about, I'm the least racist person you know. But the policies and the lack of follow through in terms of promises is just as nefarious. Um, so it's like, do I want to be um, bludgeoned in, in the face right away? Or do I want to be stabbed a thousand times slowly over a long period of time? That's essentially the option. Uh, when, you know, in my estimation, a number of the other parties, Green Party, for instance, um, and for some, the Libertarian Party um, offers, at least you know where they stand. Here's my policy, this is what I'm gonna do. Um, and the challenge I think with Republicans and Democrats is that they're part of the, the big machine. So if I am specific about my policy, you are gonna eat me alive uh, in the debates. Um, yeah. You got plenty of time to research, get your um, aides and assistants to figure out the best pivots. Um, and, you know, these are skillful politicians. You know, it's, it's not who wants to be the high school president. Uh, these are folks who have invested large sums of money in market research. So we've polled the good folks in Ohio. We generally have a good idea about where they stand on certain issues. So we know which commercials to run in Ohio. We know which buttons to push. So it's, it's a game. Um, and I think one of the things that third parties and more uh, parties, uh, obviously there's more than three, but I think one of the advantages that they have is that, you know what, we're not really considered to be in the game anyway. So let's come with some clear policies. So when I listen to uh, Green Party candidates, for instance, uh, Rosa Clemente and uh, Cynthia McKinney, uh, who was a Democrat initially from Georgia, they had clear policies, health care, education, all the things that we're talking about now. Uh, 2008, they had some policies. Uh, when I listen to some libertarians, it seems like they have a policy for everything. Um, I don't think I've heard one libertarian running for office who didn't have some type of policy. So whether or not you love it or hate it, they have something tangible that you can say, all right, this is what makes sense to me, or no, this doesn't make sense to me. Whereas with the Democrats and Republicans, like you said, you're gonna get a dog and pony show and listen, let me tell you about this person. I'm not that person, but let me tell you what they did. <laughs> and so it's just political theater. <laughs> yeah, so one thing, an issue that I have with the Democrats in particular, and one reason why there's a sort of incongruence with the average black person is that black people tend to be conservative with respect to, you know, tr you know, traditional, we, we're, right. we're very right. traditional, right? right. Uh, we tend to be uh, God fearing, you know, uh, you know, going to church or at least reverential about it. And, and then all of the sort of values that the black church uh, promotes, those are values that the sort of garden variety typical black person are going to support um and even more uh even more so for black men i think something that's happened and this is this has been this has had a, had a deleterious effect on on the black community is there's this wedge that's being driven between black men and black women mm -hmm. Because more of the issues, I think, that black women tend to be uh, passionate about or that affect them, the Democrats uh, 
are sort of serving, even if it's just in a symbolic way, they send, tend to serve more of those issues. And a lot of the issues that black men identify with um, aren't necessarily being served. And now, they're not being served by probably served by Republicans either. But there seems to be this wedge that's being driven uh, between black men and black women. And if you look at the numbers, the statistics in our community, it is, I mean, it's, you know, it's a horror show. You know, you have 75% of, you know, out of uh, out of wedlock uh, births, uh, you know, father absence off the charts. Um, you have, um, you know, uh, what is it? 59% of black women are baby mamas. And, you know, and something like 60 or 70% of the ones that are baby mamas are baby mamas by multiple guys. You know, you have all of these all of these things and I think black women have been sold this sort of bill of, of goods that says you know what you don't need a man you know you can do it your, yourself they've sort of bought into the whole white feminist thing which I think has been very effective for white women but it's been very damaging for our community and for black women they go to college in pursuit of their degree almost in defiance of needing a man. They're trying to prove that they don't need a man as opposed to the way that a lot of you know women do in other cultures where they're able to go to college and in addition to get their degree, they also get the MRS. Okay. You know, and so we have this, um, we're having this sort of um, a philosophical battle because it seems like more and more we agree on less and less. Mm -hmm. You know, there seems to be this divide and it seems like the political parties are sort of manipulating that. And I would argue in the beginning of this whole thing, they were the ones that caused it. Right. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Well, I mean, I, I think a couple of things. I think that we can never underestimate the role the state has played in breaking up black families. Um, if we think about the origins of children protective services, um, social welfare, you know, you can have assistance, but there can't be a man present. And so many men left to secure those benefits. Uh, and it's probably a much longer conversation, but when we think about the cyclical forms of poverty that exist in certain communities, whether we're talking about housing, policing, healthcare, things of that sort, um, those have all had impacts on the community. And I think, as you pointed out, um, you know, the black community, generally speaking, does tend to be rather conservative. Um, what's interesting is uh, doing a lot of research on hip hop. That was one of the striking things that, that you find um, when you look at the responses. I think it was Calvin Butts, um, Nigel Ennis, and a number of other activists who were championing getting rid of, you know, certain forms of rap music because of this content, et cetera. Um, which, you know, was one of the moments in time where you see people on the conservative side and the far left kind of working together to uh, censor rap music. Um, so it, it's really interesting because you see, <laughs> wow, this community as a whole is fairly conservative, except for, you know, the race issue. But it's like, if you're not going to be outspoken on that, then who will? Um, but I think part of the challenge is that, um, the way in which feminism operates, as I understand it, um, there is a, a mainstream feminist movement in the United States that really came to the fore. Um, I know there are different waves, suffrage movement, reproductive rights. I understand that. Um, but I think it really came to the fore in the 1960s. Feminist Mystique was a, was a big book at the time. And as you point out, for white women, let me say middle class, largely middle class white women, that was a, a revelation. It's like a watershed moment. Uh, but for a number of black and brown women, it's like, okay, yeah, we know this. We've been going through this forever. Um, and I think that that particular agenda uses the language of sisterhood and let's work together. Um, but when race creeps in yep. there, 
Uh, and class becomes the issue that those black women get abandoned, um, which is why you have the sisters sitting down in the 70s at the uh, Combahatchee River Collective, um, kind of outlining their own agenda. And so I think the differences, um, and there, there are tons of uh, scholars who, who talk about this. Joan Morgan comes to mind right now, um, Patricia Hill Collins, um, and there, there are a number of others. But I think one of the things that I pull from, from their research is that there is a clear agenda for black women. Uh, and sometimes that gets conflated. Or I shouldn't say conflated. It gets lost in the larger feminist conversation. Uh, so it, it's, it's a problem because I think when I look at Africana womanism as expressed by Clonora Hudson Weems, they look at black men as compliments, not as adversaries. And so the feminist project that they're working with is about how do we sustain and build black families, African families. That's, that's important. So before we do anything, we need to continue to sustain families. And that's the main point. But often, you know, when you hear conversations, at least in, in mainstream circles, that's not, that's not part of the conversation. So I think that particular agenda um, has purposefully left out uh, the importance of black families. You know, that's that's one of the most important institutions, if not in the black community. And I think the other thing that's happened is this narrative of single black mothers and how problematic that is. And I kind of challenge that. I, I think that healthy black people can raise healthy black children. Um, but I don't necessarily know that just because if we're talking about heterosexuals, a man and a woman are together, if they're not healthy, that's equally problematic. Um, but I think there is this narrative um, and you hear it all the time, right? I think uh, mm. Barack Obama, when he was when he was still president, gave an address to Morehouse College and it was sort of like, um, you know, you need to be responsible, you need to do this. Um, but we don't often hear that message for other um, fathers. Um, so I've, I don't think I've heard, unless I missed it, where there have been national calls for white men to get their act together because they're having children out of wedlock. Um, so even though when you look at the numbers, um, our community, even though it gets talked about more frequently, we're not necessarily leading the stat categories when it comes to um, fathers who are not present in their children's lives. Well, one thing that's, that's the case is that, uh, you know, uh, some of these studies show that actually black fathers, the ones that are involved with their kids' life, they're they're like the best fathers. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know that's a, that's a, um, you know that's one thing. Another thing, uh, although I agree that um, it's not going to be healthy. Uh, it, say if you have a you know you have the the, the mom and the dad uh, they're still together in the same house and they don't necessarily have a healthy relationship um based on uh financial considerations i still think it would be slightly better even if the uh for the for the for the children because once you, so <laughs> once the dad leaves the house leaves the home it necessarily C creates a, a a huge dip in finances resources mm -hmm. that are going to be available mm -hmm. for the kid and that's one of the things that is the most damaging um uh but obviously you know healthy relationships are going to be better right, uh, right. for kids yeah. and that's what we want to strive for yeah um, I, I think you know i think you're right i mean it, obviously if you have uh two earners uh in the household right that that's that's better um and then just in terms of schedules um you know if you're trying to raise children let's say you have more than one maybe you got two or three and you're trying to juggle their schedules with your work schedule um there's only one of you so you can't be everywhere at the same right. time something something's got to give so i think in that respect having um, a partner would certainly help um but i think right the the conversation is almost like demonizing black women um if they they don't have a man in the house um and it's like what have you done you've ruined your life and it's like well you know things haven't well, worked out also, for me that way Rain, it's also demonizing black men 
Absolutely. Uh, you know, Absolutely. This, this sort of uh, chastising tone that you, you mentioned, uh, you know, Barack Obama, basically, you know, you know, finger wagging black men. Hey, you need to, you know, this kind of thing. That's the kind of thing that has chased black men out of black church. That's one of the reasons why you have a, a, a ever diminishing number of uh, marriage age <laughs> marrying age uh, black men in church and you go to black church and all you see is single mothers and except for maybe the you know the uh, path to life or something <laughs> right um, and you know you know keep keep doing this telling you know getting all aggressive and stuff look it, it's my contention that you know there's a there's a sector of YouTube called the black manosphere Mm -hmm. And I've interviewed a number of uh, um, important figures from that for that from that segment. Um, and uh, uh, one of the guys I haven't interviewed him yet, but I that I'm um, reaching out to him to get him on. His name is Minister Jap. Now he's very spicy. He says all kind of stuff you're not supposed to say. But I find that much of what he says, almost all of what he says, um, th there's there's something that resonates there. Um, he's a real funny cat. But one thing that he says frequently, and I can't find a disagreement with this assessment. Um, he says that the single... No, not not. I'm sorry, the not the single. He says the um, uh, the straight, free thinking black man is the last remaining minority. Hmm. Now, what he means by that is we're the ones that are least served by any of the political agendas. We're the one that's the ones that seem to be left out of the discussion. Um, as I was saying before, many of the issues that black women struggle with, Democrats will actually have policies <laughs> to at least, even if it's just symbolically, <laughs> to address and discuss those issues. But the issues that black men face yeah, I mean, one thing we have to remember is that the the thing that sparked up this whole Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, business was a black man that was being killed. All of this violence that uh, that the police are, you know, the, these interactions between the police, it's black men that are are dying. You know, uh, if you look at uh, these you know, in incarceration numbers. You look at stuff like the 94 crime bill. You look at all this stuff. It's black men that have been the ones that have been hurt the most by that stuff. But it seems as though we're the least considered. What, what, what are your thoughts? You know, I, I struggle with that because I think that we may be the most visible, uh, but black women uh, have been catching hell. Uh, so I know in 20, I think it was 2014, the African-American policy initiative started the, the say her name campaign, because so often, uh, when black women are, you know, victims of police violence, uh, it goes unnoticed and unheard. Uh, and it's only like the Sandra Bland's or Breonna Taylor's or other well-known instances that we sort of say, huh, interesting. Um, and then it's even worse for, um, black, the black trans community. It's almost like they live in silence and die in silence and, and nobody is saying anything. Um, but I think one of the issues that, um, I mean, it's a problem uh, when people are dying like that, gender aside, it's a problem. Um, but I think one of the, the issues is that we've been put in a position where we're either championing, you know, are you going to support black men who've been killed or are you going to support black women? You got to choose your side. Um, and I think that's a dangerous place for us to be put in uh, when we should be thinking about across the board. Um, this is an issue. Uh, so, you know, I think about the work that um, 
Kimberly Crenshaw is doing um, with trying to raise awareness on the violence that's happening to to women. But I think that, yeah, absolutely. You, you can't have a free thinking black man being seriously considered in the realm of politics. Um, mm. I kind of, um, uh, one of my good friends passed away, uh, Dr. Naji Muhammad, um, years ago, he say this all the time. He's like, you can't be a free thinking black man in this country without a target on your back. And so one of the things that he would always talk about was, uh, Barack Obama's rise to, um, you know, ideal candidate from just being a senator. And in that particular process, we, we all remember uh, the distancing from Jeremiah Wright, who was his pastor at, at Trinity in uh, Chicago. And so, you know, the brother I'm telling you about, uh, Dr. Muhammad, his position was that was a symbolic separation of a black man and his black mentor. Uh, now it got read as, you know, Jeremiah Wright is, uh, speaking hate and what kind of person has this as their pastor? Are you with this person or not? That's how it was read. But, you know, I think for people who study black liberation theology, they know that, uh, Jeremiah Wright was definitely speaking within that canon. Um, I think about the giant literary giant, uh, James Cone, uh, who wrote, a number of volumes. Uh, I think the 1969 classic, um, black liberation theology, I'm forgetting the whole title, but I know it came out in 69 and was like uh, a huge book. But I think the, the problem is, is that you can't have someone with that particular agenda who's focused on black families in a uncompromising way. So, you know, that part of, uh, what, what he's saying, I, I, I don't find disagreement with it. Um, because it's almost as if, there are certain expressions of black masculinity that will not be allowed. So you can have someone who's more of a centrist like uh, Barack Obama. You can have someone who's more of a, you know, let's get along and go along um, like you find throughout uh, the Democratic Party. Um, it doesn't mean that they don't have their, their strengths, but more often than not, the kind of consciousness and black masculinity that they represent is not threatening. Um, but if you take somebody who says, you know what, Jeremiah Wright has been my pastor and will continue to be my pastor. Uh, that's you, you got to watch out for that person. Um, because that's not the guy who's going to have a beer summit and say, you know, let's figure out how we can get along. That person is going to speak truth to power about the disparity in policing and do some policy changes. Um, but you you can't have that kind of masculinity present in the way that we are currently structured as a society, um, which is why I think, you know, just kind of thinking about music, you know, I, I teach a, a hip hop class. And so one of the things we're often talking about is, you know, how are certain artists popular and sure, maybe it's taste, but again, you know, it's a controlled environment in terms of who gets signed, who gets play on the radio and who we pay attention to. And so I, I'm not alone. Other scholars have said the same thing that, you know, there are only certain forms of blackness, if you will, that are going to be allowed to flow through these mainstream airwaves. Uh, so I, I don't think politics is all that much different. Um, so, and, and I think, you know, we've talked about this before, you know, by the time someone gets to that point in their career where they're at the high levels of office, they have already adopted the values of that particular culture. Oh yeah. So it's not likely that's, that's how you, that's how you get, yeah. that's how you get promoted. Yeah. It's not likely you're going to get an outlier. That's right. You, 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 you're proving the whole time that you're a team player, that you're inside the system, that you're going to not buck the system, that you're not going to upset the apple cart. You know, you, every step of the way, every promotion is another step towards, you know, um, you know, allegiance to the, you know, to the machine. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that's something that shouldn't be taken lightly. So I think that's why a number of people are not surprised when they see certain elected officials and their limitations for pushing forward a progressive agenda. It's like, you didn't get there doing that. So it's not like tomorrow you're going to be this brand new person uh, and things are going to radically change. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that's something I often think about in these kinds of conversations that, um, before that vote is cast and we even have the options, uh, those who are in that space, uh, you already have what, what will most likely be someone who's going to follow the program. Like I think about this last election, I think the Democrats probably had one of the most progressive fields to date. But the candidate who got selected was probably the least progressive. So it's like, wow, um, you potentially had a really revolutionary moment in terms of what it could look like and the policies that, at least on the campaign trail, we know sometimes it's different when folks get elected, but uh, it really could have been something different. Um, but at the end of the day, it was not. Uh, so I, I think that's always interesting. And you know, it's a conversation I have with friends sometimes. It's like, it's almost like you, you get lulled into accepting mediocrity as a great thing, right? Cause you're, you're thinking, wow, this can be this way. We can move on these policies, something that has been challenging our communities for years. Um, healthcare, for instance, some of the challenges with education, school funding. Yes, we're going to do this. And then, you know, let's pick, candidates who will pretty much preserve the status quo. Uh, and then the, the alternative is, well, it could be worse. You could have chose this person. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's the, it's the supposed good versus evil, uh, stuff. Right. You know, right. one thing that causes great skepticism on my part of the two party system that we have is how polarized uh, all of these wedge issues, right? And there's no significant, uh, there, there's no strides towards solving those issues because if you retain those issues, then you know that you can carve off a certain percentage of the electorate, right? Um, but just this sort of black and white on so many issues uh that's not how people are that's not how regular people are right we're not like you know i'm all black on this and and you're all white on this there's no gray at all it's only this or this that's not how people are they're very much there's a lot of nuance there's a lot of gray, you know, and that alone should cause people to look at the system and say, man, I mean, this is obviously a fraud. This is obviously phony. Something is wrong with what this is. There, This is obviously constructed as an elaborate ruse at, uh, 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 in order to <laughs> keep all of the same people in power, <laughs> it seems like it's it's like painfully obvious. And what makes me feel what uh, <laughs> what causes me to have a lot of uh, disappointment is the hope that people invest in these, especially in these national elections. Mm. I'm sorry, hope ain't for politics. Hope is for religion. Policy is for politics. Substance is for politics. And if you ain't giving me the policy and the substance that I need, then you need to get out of there telling me to hope in something that there's something wrong. There's something wrong already. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, what's interesting is I think about uh, the great orator as, as people, uh, some people refer to Ronald Reagan, uh, an actor, obviously, before he got into politics. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think he realized while he was governor of California that to the average person to speak to policy and, and the substance that you're talking about, they're, they're not paying attention. 
But if you can sell them a dream, I think his theme was uh, the great city. Um, and, you know, just this illusion of, you know, this is going to be wonderful. It's going to be great. And I need you to help me build this. And, and people tend to uh, go for that. Um, and I think that, you know, at least when, when I took civics back in the day, um, social institutions courses in, in undergrad, one of the things that my instructors really pressed upon us was that, you know, politicians serve at the pleasure of the people and they should be carrying out your agenda, not the other way around. Right. And in many ways, people are almost, it's almost like a religion, right? I don't think clearly about things. I just follow somebody and either you're with me or against me. And it's almost as if logic and common sense don't figure into many of these discussions when we talk about politicians. And when you say policy, people look at you like, well, what are you talking about? Um, but I think that's true. I think we have to be more focused on obviously our local communities, because some of these, as you're saying, wedge issues, like at the end of the day, is that going to impact me on my day-to-day -day life? Uh, probably not, but there are other issues that are happening right here in my community. So, you know, fracking is something that has been, you know, an issue in Ohio. Um, what's happening with certain school districts, school funding, things like that. Um, but more often than not, you know, it's immigration. You know, those people are taking our jobs. It's like, well, let's be honest. Some of you don't want those jobs anyway. Um, and it's not that those people are taking your jobs, but that's the narrative. Um, and then that becomes the thing that people get riled up about and either they're for or against. Uh, meanwhile, as you point out, some of these same people are in the position of being in the driver's seat in terms of policy. But it just, you know, what you said, there's a book that I, I really appreciated, um, How the Irish Became White. Um, Noel Ignatev, I think is his last name, but it's a really interesting study on how people can be convinced of this value in whiteness when there are other concrete issues that they're facing. So the book is, um, I won't bore you with all the details, but it's, it's one of those things where many of the Irish immigrants are coming to the United States and they're suffering the same kinds of experiences that African Americans are. And so there are attempts at you know, looking at a collective agenda to adjust, to address discrimination uh, in housing, uh, in the workplace. And one of the things those in power realize is that, you know, these people begin to mobilize around class issues, um, we're gonna have a real problem. And so the value of whiteness began to be the focus. And so obviously as, you know, America is being born and going through those birthing pains, ethnicity was like a big deal. Um, you know, folks are German, fo folks are Irish Catholic. Um, and then we move to a space where, you know, some folks don't think of themselves as having an ethnic identity, they're just white. Um, I've had students say, well, I don't have a culture, I'm just white. And it's like, sure you do. Um, nobody's just white. Um, you have ancestors who came from someplace, uh, maybe Dutch, maybe Poland. Um, but the point is, is that when you begin to invest in this notion of whiteness, um, the kinds of specificity with some of the issues that you may have in common with others gets lost. A few years ago, um, I had a, um, expo. I worked with a couple people at the university. We put on this expo and we were looking at rural and urban communities and some of the commonalities. So one of the things we were talking about at the time was the impact of mountaintop removal and sort of the challenges with the fact that it creates jobs in certain areas where there is not a lot of jobs available. But at the same time, there are obviously ecological consequences. So what do you do? Do you get this job doing this particular service that's going to have an extremely detrimental effect on the environment or, or not? What do you do? Um, and then we contrasted that with some of the issues that are facing urban communities. Um, so some of the stuff we've talked about in terms of um, substance abuse, um, poverty, rampant poverty, lack of education, access to healthcare. And one of the things that the expo kind of shown this light on was the fact that these communities are facing similar battles. Uh, in, in the area 
where we are, you know, there are a number of rural communities that are dealing with uh, methamphetamine, dealing with lack of access to health care, quality education, and, and just general lack of resources. And there are some urban spaces that are facing some similar struggles. Uh, but there is not enough, you know what, we have similar issues. Let's figure out how we can work together. Uh, maybe get some lobbyists to support our cause um, because most of the time these communities see themselves as so different. Um, but really it's it's been, how can we convince people um, that their economic consequences are the fault of someone. Um, if we can find someone to blame, uh, then we can we can move forward with what we're doing. When in actuality, there could be some real movement on working together. Um, and I think that's part of you know what what Dr. King was attempting to do in the last days of his life uh, when he was attempting to organize his Poor People campaign. And I think towards uh, sixty seven. Um, 68, obviously, up until April, I think that's where he was going, um, just in terms of being able to see that class was an issue. Um, and who knows what would have happened? I mean, we could speculate based on his later writings, but I think he was moving in the direction of recognizing that class inequality was a serious problem. So if we could couple our analysis with racial injustice as well as class, we might be able to get more buy-in from people who traditionally wouldn't wouldn't align with certain movements. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's a mistake that many people in the United States uh, don't have a, a real critical understanding of the way in which class intersects with race. Um, so you know, even when we watch the news, it's, it's usually either or, um, not necessarily together. So that I think you know that there are some things that have been done to consistently keep people at odds on the racial front when they have a lot of issues based on class that they could probably work together on. And one of the things that I've often asked myself is, you know, it's interesting to look at exit poll data um, and you see how people vote and you're like, wow, why would you consistently vote against your own economic interests? Mm. But it happens election after election. Um, and it, it's just, it's baffling on one level, but on another, it's like, okay, people have done a good job of convincing people um, of this, you know, other boogeyman, whether the other is an immigrant, whether the other is a black person, um, indigenous, whatever. Um, they've done a good job of, of convincing people who the quote unquote enemy is. Yeah. So uh, one thing that we 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 discussed a little bit was the scene and I'm going to I'm going to share my screen so we can see what I'm talking about. Excuse me, Mr. X. Mm -hmm. Hi, I, I've read some of your speeches and I honestly believe that Fair a lot use. of what you have to say is true. Fair use. And, and I'm a good person in spite of what my ancestors did. I, I just, I wanted to ask you, what can a white person like myself who isn't prejudiced, what can I do to help you and, and further your cause? Nothing. My high school was a black ghetto in Roxbury, right here in Boston. When you saw that in the movie, or when, you, when you're when you seeing it right now, like what is that, what, what, what do you think of? What does that cause you to think of? I can't help but to think of the autobiography. <laughs> um, I think I liked it when I saw the movie. Um, I was, I'm sure I was a teenager. And uh, I was like, yeah, that's right. Uh, but I remembered reading the autobiography and he talked about that incident and now they're calling it allies and allied behavior. But what he says in the book is that, you know, why do you, and he's even, um, there's a couple of speeches where he addresses this. He said, you know, white people who want to help uh, should not be involved in black organizations. Uh, they should go back and work with their own. And in the book, he sort of elaborates a little more where he basically says, you know, your role would be to learn more about yourself and to work with other white people. 
Um, so today we have more fancy language uh, for that. You know, we talk about allied behavior um, where, you know, people of certain dominant groups talk to other dominant group members in a way that perhaps you and I couldn't um, if we were talking about racism, for instance. Um, but yeah, when I saw the scene, just purely as, uh, you know, I, I liked it uh, because I think he captures the feeling that many of us have, um, like, what can you do? Nothing. I, you know, don't help me help yourself. Um, and we, we kind of see that sentiment from, um, other folks, uh, of that particular time period. But yeah, I, yeah, it, it's some good memories. I remember, uh, the film and, uh, reading the autobiography. I read that I, I've taught it before. So, um, I have no idea how many times I've read it. Uh, but yeah, it continues to be an important piece of literature. Um, and of course we have to acknowledge, uh, that the autobiography as a genre has its, its shortcomings, but I think looking at it for, um, what it is, um, a testament to Malcolm's evolution, uh, his educational philosophy, uh, is in there as well as sort of his, um, spiritual and political awakening. Uh, so yeah, uh, that, that, that's what I think when I see it. It's interesting in my own uh, journey, I have, you know, I started out as more of a kind of progressive Democrat, very influenced by my, uh, you know, by the political positions of my father, uh, who's been a lifelong Democrat. He was a, a bureaucrat in uh, state government. Uh, high-ranking bureaucrat in state government up in Michigan and uh, and you know I, I got older and I started asking certain questions I'm a Christian so I was having some issues with certain uh, sort of culture shifting sort of policies and kind of um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm fine with you saying, hey, this is what we think. Uh, these are policies or this is what, you know, how we think things should be. If you like that, then come on and join our team. It's another thing for you to tell me what I'm allowed to say um, when I'm not part of your party. And I don't ag I don't agree with necessarily. Maybe I just have a different way of looking at things. Um, and so there was a lot of that kind of coming from that direction. And so that kind of pushed me probably further right. Um, and, and then, you know, for, and, you know, but I always kind of saw this thing as being this kind of waffling kind of phony thing where, uh, how are you supposed to actually know what's going on? And is the media really telling us the truth? And, you know, there's just you know, all of these questions uh, spiraling uh, to where I became a lot more independent um, politically and then more libertarian. Um, and something happened, uh, especially over this uh, the pandemic. Uh, all of the thoughts were there. The, the seeds had been planted. My sort of uh, uh, hero worship of Malcolm X when I was a kid, you know, he had that rebel factor and there was that swag. It was just something mm -hmm. that he had that was just <clears throat> potent. And I find myself almost in lockstep with his 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 uh his uh his politics almost in lockstep um black nationalist yet somewhat libertarian mm -hmm. um it's it's <laughs> it, 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 it's it's such a uh <laughs> it's such a it's such a strange uh it's such a strange thing how that uh how that has sort of worked its worked itself out in my life but when i saw this scene when i saw the whole movie i mean uh you know it was it was great because i read his you know autobiography when i was a kid and so that was that was cool but when i saw this scene and when i see it now it just reminds me that we as black people, we don't need your help. 
We don't need white people, folks help. We just need you to get out of the way. We just need you to not do things that attack our progress, that, that impede our progress. That's what we need you to stop doing. Stop doing that and stand out of the way and we're going to be fine. Right, right. It's funny, you know, Malcolm was being interviewed by Johnny Carson and he said something similar uh, when he asked him, you know, what is it that you want? And he said, Johnny, I'm the man you think you are. I want my kids to be able to live in this world without being harassed. I want access. So I'm not looking for a handout. I'm not looking for any special favors. I just need the way cleared so I can do the things that I need to do like you're doing it. Um, so yeah, same sentiment. Um, I don't necessarily need my hand held. I just need you to get out of the way and ensure that I have access in the way that you have access. And you can do that by moving out of the way and stopping with some of the limitations that are impeding me. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, I, I think Malcolm's analysis, um, it, it still speaks to me. I still think that he's one of the most important voices in the 20th century just in yeah. terms of one, his personal story of transformation. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's powerful. Um, one of the best books um, about his religious transformation, ironically, is by a fundamentalist Christian, uh, DeCaro, uh, the, on the religious side of my people, the religious life of Malcolm X. And I think he does a pretty good job of charting uh, Malcolm's spiritual evolution and his growth, um, which unfortunately, when we talk about Malcolm X, that oftentimes is overshadowed by other conversations. But I think to look at him as someone who's had a significant amount of growth and what DeCaro uh, frames as a, a religious conversion experience uh, is worth study. Uh, and I also appreciate his ability to be authentic um, so it wasn't unusual for him to say, you know what? I was wrong. I've thought about this. I've learned some new information and the previous position I held was incorrect. How many public figures actually say I was wrong? Um, they're usually saying, no, you were wrong. Cause you thought that's what I said, but that's not what I said. Um, but he's someone who, as he learned and grew, he can own it. Uh, and I remember when, he left the nation of Islam. Uh, he talked about, you know, I want to offer an apology for the things that I've said and done to others. And uh, I'm willing to work with folks, but he never lost his commitment to black people and black nationalism. Uh, so right. I think as people have tried to paint him into this, well, you know, after he came back from Mecca, he was this kind of, it's like, no, right, right. That, that right. founding rally, when he got right. back, he said, no religion is going to blind me from the realities of what's going on here. Um, right. Truth is truth, no matter what. So I appreciate that uncomp uncompromising stand uh, to speak the truth. And you that's know, in the movie. That, I mean, he says yeah. that in the movie. It's yeah. in the movie. <laughs> it's clear as day. Yeah. There are, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, I think his, his founding rally, the OAU um, founding rally speech that he makes. Uh, and then the fact that he was attempting to uh, bring charges against the United States for human rights violations. And he was adamant that we need to think of the struggle, not as a civil rights struggle, but as a human rights struggle in order to internationalize what was going on. So I think his global vision uh, was really ahead of his time. And even though maybe not in the United States, people don't regard him that way, but certainly international, uh, on the international front, he was respected like that. Uh, so yeah. yeah, I think his analysis uh, is something I, that I return to in terms of looking at uh, previous scholarship. Uh, and I think, yeah, I think you're right. Because uh, I think if we're honest, I mean, that's one of the things he said, be honest, tell the truth. Um, we're not going to get anywhere with these wishy-washy tactics. And here we are in 2021 having some very similar conversations that people had in the past. Yep, Same old okie doke, man. They keep using the same moves. You know, it's like, uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's like a football team. You know, the, you know, they run it up the middle, you know, they're going to run it up the middle 80% of the time. Right. 
you can't do nothing about it. Yep. They just keep yep. running it up the middle. <laughs> and they may tell you, listen, next play, right here. All you can do is watch, right? <laughs> yep. 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 There it is. <laughs> Seven yards, nine yards, right, right. <laughs> five yards, ten yards. You can't do nothing about it. Um. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, you know, Martin Luther King, he gets, it, it's like he gets all the press. Um, and, of course, you know, we all love Martin. Um, but for my money, I, I just always, there's just something about Malcolm that just um, really captivates. And it's satisfying to the way it's it, 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 it i mean the masculinity oh, you know that scene when uh what was it uh he was at the what was at the he was at the police office uh, uh oh okay department the 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 ronald stokes incident yeah that was it Oh man, and the in the uh, and he just move his hand, and all them brothers. <laughs> oh man, it's powerful. The, oh yeah. man, I was like, yeah, it was powerful. Yeah. You know what's interesting is there was um, I think it was Orlando Bagwell, nineteen ninety, was it ninety three, ninety four, somewhere around there. It was a documentary called uh, Malcolm X Make It Plain, and they talk about the real life incident. And I think for me. Um, <clears throat> You know, I'd heard stories, uh, you know, people tell you, you know, different oral histories and I had researched it, but I think when I first saw that documentary, um, a number of his siblings are in there talking about it. And I was just always blown away um, by the discipline of the fruit of Islam and then, you know, Malcolm's conviction. Uh, and so, you know, I always think about, you know, when he was younger, he wanted to be a lawyer and his teacher told him he couldn't. Um, and I see a lot of those persuasive techniques, uh, in his speeches and in his, you know, his movement. Um, so it's almost like, um, it's, it's a jury We're we're part of the jury and a number of his speeches, he's making a compelling argument about the United States and our treatment. Um, so the call and response technique, uh, and the way that he could sort of, you know, make his speech plain so that, you know, the average person could listen and, and say, yeah, I, I understand, um, you know, his analysis in message to the grassroots, um, just, just very plain spoken. It's like, wow. I remember the first time I heard that speech, I was in high school and, um, that was the first time I heard his voice. Like I'm reading speeches, reading about him, but it's something powerful about hearing his voice. Uh, so as a young high school, I'm like, wow. This is, this is impressive. Um, and, and I, I get that he is part of a tradition, right? It, it's not just him in isolation, but he comes out of, you know, the Garveyite tradition, uh, Padmore and other, um, black nationalists before him. But I think his representation of it is one of those things that kind of just, just stays with you. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think King, and it's interesting about King cause it's not even a full King, right? It's like, the guy died right after uh, the March on Washington, and that's it. So I think one of the things I've, I've done is to read his speeches, like where do we go from here, his book, where do we go from here, um, and then a number of his addresses post-1963 to kind of see the evolution of his thinking. Um, and that, unfortunately, is the king that we don't talk a whole lot about. You know, the one who says, you know, the triplets of evil are militarism, poverty and racism, um, and that our moral compass is off in the United States. Um, or as, you know, the radical King, as the edited volume suggests, uh, but yeah, you're right. Uh, he does get a lot of mileage. Um, and unfortunately it's not the more, and I'll, I hate to say the more insightful because it's not to say that he wasn't before, but I think that King post 1963 had seen some things and had experienced some things and, and had a different kind of consciousness and was beginning to reflect that. And, you know, I, I often wonder had he and Malcolm actually been able to have the conversation they were planning to have, um, what might have been the outcome? 
Um, and I think in many ways they, they needed each other. Mm. You know, if you're not listening to Dr. King, then you got to deal with this alternative. Um, and I think Cone, uh, James Cone, can't escape him. Um, in his book, The Dream and the Nightmare, really, you know, kind of articulates that uh, that that they do they do need each other. Um, and it doesn't necessarily always have to be either this one or that one. Um, but there is value in what they're saying, even though they both have different perspectives. So, you know, to put it in Cone's word, Dr. King sees possibility. It's the dream. And of course, Malcolm's like, nah, this is a nightmare. You know, we need to get out of this nightmare. Um, so, yeah, I, I often think about uh, Malcolm's analysis now um, because a lot of the things that he said actually have come to pass. Um, you know, when he talks about, you know, desegregating lunch counters and he's like, you know, I think you had it up. Um, it was part of the video thread. He gives a, a interview at the University of Berkeley, I think it is. And they're asking him about the civil rights movement. Is it a success? And he's like, I can tell you what they think. Um, and so I was like, man, this man was brilliant. Um, and people were so obsessed with, is he hateful or not, that they often missed his analysis. Um, but yeah, I, I think that um, he's certainly someone who's worthy of study and thinking about following up on some of his ideas. Uh, just, you know, his speeches alone, uh, the fact that he wrote a uh, curriculum, educational curriculum when he was locked up. I mean, it was just a lot of things that he brought to the table that uh, are undervalued in many ways. Now, um, I want to play this clip. The, you, you like the boondocks? Oh, <laughs> you, you already know the clip I'm going to play. Okay. <laughs> you, you, are, you already know. It's, yep, it's, it's that one. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. There you. There you. Excuse me, brothers and sisters, please. If someone could just turn off. King looked out on his people and saw they were in great need. So he did what all great leaders do. He told them the truth. Will you, will you and niggas, please shut the hell up? <gasps> he just said what I think he said. Is this it? This is what I got all those ass whoopings for? I had a dream once. It was a dream that little black boys and little black girls would drink from the river of prosperity, freed from the thirst of oppression. But lo and behold, some four decades later, what have I found but a bunch of trifling, shiftless, good-for-nothing niggas. And I know some of you don't want to hear me say that word. It's the ugliest word in the English language, but that's what I see now, niggas. And you don't want to be a nigger, cause niggas are living contradictions. Niggas are full of unfulfilled ambitions. Niggas wax and wane. Niggas love to complain. Niggas love to hear themselves talk but hate to explain. Niggas love being another man's judge and jury. Niggas procrastinate until it's time to worry. Niggas love to be late. Niggas hate to hurry. Black entertainment television is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. Usher, Michael Jackson is not a genre of music. And now I'd like to talk about soul playing. I've seen what's around the corner. I've seen what's over the horizon. And I promise you, you niggas have nothing to celebrate. And no, I won't get there with you. I'm going to Canada. Thank you, Huey. Thank you, Dr. King. Do what you can.
I think my only issue with the boondocks was I thought it was some pretty effective uh, satire. But it's like, man, how many M-bombs can you drop in the show? Yeah. Uh, so it's just like, okay. You know, I, I think that obviously we got to unpack that a little bit. Um, I think about how, and we were kind of talking about this before, um, certain aspects of black culture gets reproduced and packaged and sold to us uh, through hip hop, for instance, through films, TV shows. And so what we're seeing for a number of people is, ooh, this is authentic. This is what black people do. And I think we lose sight of the fact that it is managed and controlled and packaged by corporations. And so it's not undiluted, pure, authentic, black cultural expressions coming to us. It's a product. Um, and it's also part of socializing us into particular norms, air quotes, about black people. Uh, the great sociologist Herman Gray talks quite a bit about this uh, in terms of how television provides us with this homogenized norm uh, that we all are supposed to fit into. And one of the things that we do in that space is to provide, you know, comic relief um, to fulfill certain stereotypes. So when I see it, you know, I think cultural context is important. Um, mm -hmm. That's important to unpack what's going on in that scene. But if you're watching it and you don't have that, uh, it, it seems quite stereotypical. Um, but I think that's sort of the brilliance of, of good satire, right? It toes that line between, wow, this is great, or wow, this is a problem. Um, but I think that it's interesting the way that Dr. King is positioned. Um, but I've heard people say that all the time. You know, if Dr. King were alive today, he'd be shocked. Um, he'd be like, what? what's going on? Um, so yeah, I think the boondocks, and, and Aaron Magruder is a, is an African-American studies, uh, was an African-American studies major. So I, I can kind of see what he's doing in there just in terms of providing the satire and, and leaving us this space to think about. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I watched that and then I think, wow, this is not, um, I mean, I don't think Dr. King would obviously talk that way, but I think <laughs> that energy would probably be pretty consistent. Like, what are, what are you doing? Um, it's it's funny because there's like there's like some Malcolm energy on that actually. That's that was that's something that I uh, when I first saw that I was like, that's not the us that's not the way that we usually think of Martin, right? Uh, that's not the Martin. Th that's not the way we think about Martin. Uh, uh, you know, peaceful Martin. You know. I got a dream. I've got a dream, Martin. Right, right. That's not right. that's not that Martin. Um, and uh, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I I I think I think there would be some disappointment with uh, where we are. The fact that we haven't really gotten anywhere. Yeah, yeah. In most respects. Yeah, and and. That and in many ways, maybe we have digressed because at least our families were more in, in, intact, you know? Um, yeah. 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 And I think that's, that's kind of what I was uh, hinting at before that the more radical aspects of Dr. King have been right. sort of sanded down. Um, it's funny. Cornel West uh, often talks about the Santa Clausification of Dr. King. We've defanged him. Um, we made him like Santa Claus. He's a happy, jolly guy having a dream. He's not the one who had a critique about capitalism or militarism or a lack of concern for poor and working class folk, regardless of color in the United States. Um, so we, we like the king who had the dream. And uh, there's a historian, uh, Charles McKinney, who often talks about, you know, if we listen to the full text of the I have a dream speech, there's some really good stuff in there beyond the judge not by the color of skin, content of character kind of stuff. But he talks about insufficient funds um, in terms of African-Americans receiving in this country. He talks about unfulfilled promises, essentially. So it's like, even if we want to stay with the speech that most people know, 
Um, let's think about some of the other pieces that he raises um, that are worth thinking about. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, the 1967 Riverside speech uh, is the one that I, that I, I really like that speech. Um, because I think that he he's called to the carpet by some of the younger activists, Stokely Carmichael at the time. Uh, and others were like, well, if you believe in nonviolence, well, what about the war? What about what we're doing? And I think he had to really wrestle with what what his moral conscience was saying. And then also, you know, you've reached a certain level of respect and stature. And you know, if you say anything against the war, all of that goes away. Um, but he took that stand. Um, I remember him being on the Mike Douglas show and sort of being grilled about why he wasn't in support of the war. And, you know, he's very principled and held his ground. And he made the moral argument that, you know, this is not what we should be doing. And so I thought that takes real courage to be able to stand in the face of that after you've already sort of arrived as a public figure. Uh, you could have very easily not said anything, um, but you're willing to risk your notoriety. Uh, and I think it was Newsweek, Newsweek or Time, that said that he had fallen out of favor um, and that he was no longer in touch with the pulse of what was going on. Um, and I thought, you know, that was probably the moment where he was most in touch. Mm. Um, but yeah, that, that King... Um, again, probably not that language, but I think that King would have definitely been someone to raise those issues. Um, but it's unfortunate because, you know, that's not the King who most of us know, um, and study. Um, I think we, you know, just married to the idea of the, I have a dream guy. Um, but I think to do what he was doing, um, in the face of, just, just outright hatred, um, you know, shouldn't be taken lightly. Yeah, you know, uh, my, you know, I remember having these conversations with my dad, and he would frequently say stuff like, um, you know, white folks, you know, they they liked King because the alternative was like. Stokely Carmichael and you know Malcolm X and and you know uh, H. Rap Brown, you know, burn baby burn right. So the mm -hmm. the so just the and and my father would even say um, that in, in a sense it was more of these sort of violent elements or these at least uh, implied implied violence uh, that maybe did more of the work to at least get folks to the table to to, to talk mm. you know because of the fear element right and and I remember as a kid you know I, I, I didn't like that idea you know I I, I wanted the I wanted the dream, right? Okay. <laughs> I wanted the the more peaceful thing, and uh, and the older that I've gotten, although I d don't think that violence is is the right way, I, I have to acknowledge that that has played a major role, and actually, <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying this, in actually, you know, moving <laughs> moving things forward, even if it's just out of fear. You know, it's like, man, we better do something. We better, hey, we better, right. <clears throat> and I'm on, and I'm gonna say, where we are right now, with uh, these protests and a lot of the riots and things, uh, I, I think there's a lot of fear. I think that there's still a lot of fear. And honestly, if 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 I am honest and if I say what I'm really thinking in most cases i think it's the fear that's actually keeping some of the dialogue going on to mm. continue mm. um you know like when i'm uh you know we're we're both you know engaged in academia and um 
you know, the whole white liberal thing, <laughs> the whole white liberal thing where there's some positive things there, but there's a great deal of uh, what feels like, uh, what's the, what's the word I want? Uh, not really a what, what's the, the uh, <laughs> it's, it's an easy word that I can't think of right now uh, well it it, it 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 feels like it doesn't feel genuine Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. It, it don't feel. It don't feel. It. It doesn't feel real to me. It feels right. like, okay, we're gonna have these conversations. We're gonna do this, you know, this inclusion, this and then all that. We're gonna do all this. Right. Stuff. Right. I understand. And and then my thing is like, why is it that it took you this long? And so so why are you doing this right now? I want to know why you're doing it now. So, because it's not like that there's more evidence now than there was before. So what's the, what is different? So this movement has now caused you to come to Jesus. Okay. That's, that's what's happening, you know? And again, it, again, it makes me think that the fear component is the active component and not necessarily the changing of hearts and minds mm -hmm. because the my, hearts and minds could have changed before this stuff went down. This stuff is a this has been the same stuff. And we've been telling you that it's this, that this is, <laughs> we've been telling you that this has been the stuff. All right. So I don't know. That's what do you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, th I agree. I think that the whole performative allyship, as it's as it's called, is um, yeah, it's it's ingenuous. It's it's disingenuous, I should say. You know, I, I look at the NFL with the Black Lives Matter on the helmets and on fields. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Yeah, that's this good. is the like, same organization, <laughs> right? That has a Rooney Rule that they can't even follow the Rooney Rule. <sighs> the guy who got. Uh, the Kansas City Chiefs to two Super Bowls back to back. Offensive coordinator can't be hired for a head coaching job. <laughs> it's almost laughable. Um, I remember Josh McDaniels years ago uh, was the it kid because he worked with the Patriots, uh, Patriots, and got a job uh, for uh, I think it was the Denver Broncos. Colossal failure, but you know he he got an opportunity. Um, and I'm thinking, wow, here's a guy who's done things the way that they tell you you're supposed to do. You move up the ranks. You're a line or position uh, personnel guy. Then you become an assistant. Then you become a coordinator. And then the next step, ideally, is a head coaching position. Uh, but not so much for him. Um, but, yeah, you're right. I mean, many of these things that could have happened, we found – reasons why they shouldn't happen or why it wasn't that. Mm. Uh, and I just thought to myself, um, you know, the whole Colin Kaepernick conversation, uh, the NFL missed a real opportunity. You know, you embrace the fact that this guy is, is protesting and you actually implement some change and then you put the issue to bed and you're not talking about it on and on and on. You've moved past it and it doesn't hurt your game. Um, yeah, I, th I think they played it. Uh, patronizing was the word that I was looking for. Mm, <laughs> patronizing. Yeah. But they played it wrong on both sides. I mean, they could have played it. They could have nipped it in the bud right from the jump like this, saying, no, we're not playing that. And, and then just it's over. Right. They could have done that. Or they could have done what it, what it is that you just suggested. They could have done either of those things. They played it poorly in any any interpretation of it. Right. Was played poorly. And now, what is their revenue down like 50% or something? Yeah. Like Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and it, and it's one of those things where you 
like you said, it, they definitely played it wrong. But I, I feel like if you, but you know, th- this is the same league that is championing um, breast cancer awareness month with the pink cleats and shirts, but have no real policy on intimate partner violence until people are badly hurt and or killed. I think it, it was the Kansas city chief player um, who killed his fiance. And it's like, you can't have it both ways. You can't soft pedal your interest in Ray these Rice. issues. You, Ray yeah, Rice absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, Brett Favre um, didn't get as much attention. Uh, I think Mark Tremera, there, there's a bunch of guys um, over the years. And it's like, you know, you spend so much time in denial and in avoidance when, you know, best way is just let's, let's get out in front of this thing and then we can control the narrative and then we'll move forward. And the thing about it is, if you take an uncompromising stand and you do something, then what can people say after that? You can legitimately say, you know what? We've addressed that issue and we've done X, Y, and Z toward it. Right. You can't hit me over the head with that anymore because I've, I've taken care of it. Yeah. But it was the yeah. waffling. It was the waffling about it's the waffling about that mm-hmm. got them in trouble. As I'm saying, they could have said, you know what, we're going to support this guy. We're going to we're going to do something specific to deal with this. Or they like, like I said, or they could have said, we're just not going to deal with this, period. Right. And they could have just did like this. And then that whole thing is over. Either yeah. way, it's over. But it's the sort of again in this sense it's it's like the fear of addressing certain topics or whatever the fear that they had caused them to make these erratic decisions right that just it just it just made the thing more pronounced than it ever needed to be right right um, so yeah and it's you know it underscores the need for um, different voices in those leadership rooms. Um, you're talking about billionaires who are not in touch with the average U.S. citizen. So their worldview of, you know, what's going on is is quite different than most of us. Um, and some of the choices that they made in the handling of it, it's like, this is ridiculous. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a real missed opportunity. Uh, and I think that generally... I find myself kind of paying attention and asking that, well, why now? What's so important now? Um, and so, fear. yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I think that it's fear. And then it's the fact that, you know, we're, we're in this pandemic. And so people are at home way more than they have been. And some of us are actually thinking, it's like, wow, you know what? Maybe things are as bad as people say. Um, but I'm with you in terms of it's not as if, these things just started to increase. Um, they have no. been happening. People have been talking no, it's about been the it. same stuff. Um, and it's like, Hey, pay attention. Hey, pay attention. Um, you know, in, in, in something that is like kind of on my nerves too, is, uh, even in this last election, um, where some voices, and I think legitimately raising the 94 crime bill and raising, you know, Kamala's, uh, you know, her record, you know, as as uh, what is it, um, a district attorney, mm-hmm. you know, in LA County, um, and saying, hey, you know, black men, black men have a reason to look at this and say, hey, what's up? But that conversation often wasn't even allowed to be had because of this whole again, this um, polarized thing where it's like if it sounds like you're saying something that's negative towards biden you know towards that ticket then that mean must mean that you're voting for trump yeah 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 so you can't even have you can't even have like a conversation about it you can say hey you know this is this is like this is kind of and then you got really absurd talking points from some about how she's this communist and i was like have you seen her voting not voting but her record in terms of prosecution that that's ridiculous but i think for some, it's like, listen, we need to unify. We need to come together. Um, I, you know, it's difficult to come together and unify if you haven't done the healing work that needs to take place first. Mm. Uh, and I don't think we have done that um, to any significant degree. Um, you just can't not deal with the issues and then say, okay, we're going to heal. We're going to come together. Um, not really. You know, it reminds me of, you know, 
uh, playing with cousins when I was a kid. We get in trouble. And a parent or somebody says, okay, hug it out. It's like, I don't want to hug this guy. I'm still mad at him. Um, but you do the fake hug and you say you're sorry and you're not sorry. You just know that's what you need to do because an adult told you. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that in some ways we're asking society to do that. We haven't worked anything out. We haven't seriously gone through things that may help us address some of the challenges that we're seeing. I think one of the things that South Africa did that really helped to move that society forward was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where they could have an honest, upfront conversation about apartheid, who did what, why they did it, name the names, um, and it really allowed for that country to move forward. Has it been perfect since then? No, it hasn't. But mm -hmm. at least they have said, let's have this conversation and let's not pander, let's not placate each other, let's, let's be real about it. Um, and I think that that would, that would go a long way. But, you know, there are a number of people in this country who would say, absolutely not. There's nothing to apologize for. It is what it is. People need to quit complaining. Stop playing the victim card. Um, but I think just having um, an honest conversation about what's happened and the intentional blocks to certain uh, communities' progress would, would be helpful. But, you know, I, we would probably put a lot of people out of a job because there are people whose sole job it is is to benefit from uh, this group is playing the victim. See how they're playing you? Um, so it, it, it's, it's a mess. Uh, so, so I have one mess. last question, and it's obvious uh, to me that we, we need to do this again. Because, I mean, we, it seems like we can talk for a long time. We, we got a lot to talk about. Right, right. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you put um, two professors together, this, this is what happens. <laughs> um. And uh, and I have a I have a live stream too. Maybe we could uh, figure out how to do how to do one of those. It's like a weekly live stream, but we you know we'll 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 talk about it. But uh, I definitely want to bring you back for this for another talk like this. This this was uh, this was really great, and I think it was timely because you know Black History Month and right. and all. Um, but the last question I wanted to ask you is about reparations. Mm. And I talked to Larry about Larry Sharp about mm -hmm. uh, reparations, and that was an interesting uh, conversation. Of course, he has policy. I'm sure <laughs> he, he does. Very clear, but sure he has very clear policy on it. Yeah. And and honestly, it was the best idea I've ever heard on uh, on 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 the topic. Um, but if people want to hear, want to hear that, they're going to have to go in and <laughs> check that Let's interview that. out. But I do want to hear what you, what, what your, what your thoughts are, uh, on, um, uh, on reparations. Hmm. That's a good question. You know, I, I have been, I'm glad you asked that. I've been reading, rereading Amos Wilson, uh, blueprint for black power recently and thinking a lot about, um, Something, I, I don't want to attribute it to the wrong person, but I, I think it was Amos Wilson uh, who said this. Um, but I, I think one of the things that has to be done is how those reparations would work. Uh, I know folks like Randall Kennedy back in the, uh, was that early 2000s, had laid out some pretty interesting plans. And there was the Encobra organization, which I think had um, some of the strategies that I think would, would be key. Like, not just here's um, $2,000 or whatever the adjusted for inflation amount is, here's your check, go off. Uh, I think that would be disastrous. Um, I think we have to start thinking about institution building, um, you know, giving people access, um, you know, housing, education, uh, the opportunity to build generational wealth. Uh, I think that would be the kind of reparations that would make sense. Um, not, not the kind of stuff that I think most people are saying, yeah, just give me my 40 acres and my mule. Uh, I'm good. Um, yeah. Land would be great though. Um, you know, at one point in time, that was the basis of wealth. Um, and, and maybe it is to a certain degree in terms of home ownership, but I think being able to restart institutional development within communities would be the way to go. And so, 
as an educator, I'm going to say education is important, not just any education, but one that is centered on the experiences of the people who've been left out. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think we, we can see and, and know some of the failures with our educational system, um, where a lot of the significance of who people are is not reflected in the curriculum. So that would be one of the areas I think would be important. Um, also addressing some of these health disparities. There's a lot of illnesses going on. People have diabetes. Um, people have other sort of um, passed on issues, hypertension, stress, depression. Um, a number of communities, not just black folk, but um, you know, undiagnosed illnesses. Uh, you know, when you were poor um, back in the day, you, you didn't get diagnosed. So you may have had um, bipolar disorder or some other challenges that you were dealing with. So I think people need to get need to get healthy. Um, so that would be my thought process in terms of reparation, uh, basically looking at how can you build communities so they can begin to become self-sustainable. So I wouldn't be for just let's just give people money. Um, and, and then that's it. Um, and what's interesting, I think if we ever seriously entertain the conversation of represent reparations, uh, one of the things that I thought some people would figure out is that, okay, let's deal with this issue of racism and redress, give these people their reparate. Now, what do you say? We've heard you out. We listened to your grievances. Reparations has happened. We're, we're done now. Um, so it would be interesting if, if that took place. Um, but I don't know if you, yeah, that, that opens up a whole nother can of worms because if you really have a free and an autonomous people, then what happens to the foundation of your current system? Mm. Yeah. You know, so, you, you know, um, yeah. Uh, if you, if you had, uh, then if you haven't had a chance to watch that interview with Larry, his conversation on reparations is, it, it, yeah, I think you would dig it because a few of the things, a couple of the things that you said sort of implied some of the things that he went into in detail. So, yeah, I'm going to, I listened to part of it, but I'm going to check the whole thing. I think I, I was at, um, maybe the, the 10 or 15 minute mark, but I'm definitely going to kind of check. Yeah. It out. His, he, the, yeah. The, uh, yeah, he, he, he gets into it. He's, uh, and he's, he's like a fast talking, he's very clear, uh, clear of thought and, and, and he's talking a lot. He's, you know, he's saying a lot of stuff. It's a lot of substance there. So it's, it's very cool, yeah. man. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for this, man. This is, uh, <laughs> Man, should have done it. I <laughs> should have done it six <laughs> months ago. <laughs> yeah, it's been great, man. I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. It's, it's good um, yeah. to to have this dialogue. Uh, yeah, we we don't often get these conversations. Um, even though both in the academy, I, I don't often get to talk to um, other black men about these kinds of conversations. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is. I've enjoyed it just as much. Yeah. All right, man. Well, God bless you. All right. Be safe. See you All soon. All right. Now have a good one.